Hi everybody, it's Jim from Sprague Wood Turning. This week we combined some more of this awesome box elder pearl to make a platter and a three bowl set for Marcus. So before we can do any casting, of course we need to trim these so they'll fit in our casting bucket. And again, I'm using a book matched set of this awesome box of the pearl. Um, you know, things didn't go according to plan on the first casting and I'll, I'll we'll see more of that in the future. Uh, but this, this, this box of the pearl, I mean, it's just fantastic stuff. There I was just using a little bit of stoner mold release uh, and then a little bit of denatured alcohol to clean up the areas where the glue was going to set. And for this, we're going to use the deep casting epoxy from Designer Epoxy. Really loving this new thin formula. I mean, you can just tell when I'm pouring it out. That's part A. I always pour part A first, and it is just super thin and it is certainly not meant to be a stabilizing resin but on these punky pieces of this box holder burl it does a really good job penetrating um, you know these pieces and hardening up all those soft areas uh, so for the three bowl set we're going to use the emerald green um, again this is one of the more popular colors that I get asked to, to do. And you know, it's one of my favorites as well. Um, you know, I'm using a mechanical mixer. Uh, just make sure you scrape the sidewalls. And I also, I'm gonna mix up a little bit of pearl gold and we'll see where that's gonna go. And, but it's gonna be for the platter. So I figured that I would go ahead and mix that up right now. I think this, um, this casting took about, uh, three little over three liters i think is what it took so this is pearl red that's this is going to be the color for the platter and um again so important to scrape those side walls I think it took around two liters. So here in the pressure pot, this has been sitting in here now for a couple hours. And I just want to drop some gold in here and hoping that it's going to stay separate. I should have gave it another hour or two because eventually it ends up blending together. And that really wasn't the look that I was going for. All right, I'm not going to fool it anymore. That's it. All right, we'll see you guys in 72 hours. All right, so it has been a few days later. Um, <laughs> the pressure pot, or this mold that I used for this first casting, failed at a major leak, and as you can see, that's no good. Um, I've got to try and figure out what I can do with this. I, you know, you could try and pour another red on it, but you know, th that witness line is always going to be there, so. Um, I don't know. Give me your thoughts, your ideas on what I can do here other than just putting clear on it. Uh, maybe fill it in with pine cones and then another contrasting color on top of it. I don't know. There's all kinds of things that can be done with this and I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. So, with this one, uh, I decided to go with the plastic again and it seemed to work quite well. No leaks. So, we're going to get this out get the plastic pieces on. I put these plastic pieces on here so that uh, the, these hard plastic pieces from bucket so that this wouldn't infringe on the, uh, the area where the resin was sitting. So that's why those are there.
So with this piece, I didn't glue it because again, I was worried about uh, getting some spots on there. Uh, I made an error when I did the first one. Uh, from now on, I'm going to try and just use weights to hold this in place. And that's easy to do with two pieces like this. But if you've got multiple pieces like I had with the lemon glitter platter, then, you know, you're going to have to use some something to hold it in place uh, so the resin doesn't make the piece float. And by the way, I didn't put any gold in here. Uh, the gold that was in the original one, it just blended into the piece. And that's why if you look at it, the color is off just a little bit from the original color. Hopefully you can see that. So, you know, that's not really the look that I was going for. If there's any filling that needs to be done, uh, maybe we'll use a gold tinted resin then. The three bowl set was going to be uh, a lot more work than the platter was. So I figured that I would start on that. And if I encountered any issues, that would give me more time to work on that. And, you know, so while those issues are correcting themselves or being corrected, then, of course, I could work on the platter. And um, so I originally started off with the Hercules from Hunter Tool Systems. Um, Briefly went to the gouge because to get rid of all that wood on the top. But man, I tell you, that epoxy really makes that stuff hard. Um, so anyway, switch back to the Hercules. And, you know, as you can see, it's just devouring, devouring up all that resin and wood. So I'm just, I figured that, you know, I, I've got, my what's going to be my top and what's going to be the base um and again you'll see some 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 clips coming up and i mean i mean look at that resin oh i just i really really love that pearl effect from oh just really really like it and you know that pearl it's fantastic as well so there's a little push cut again with the hercules and like i've said in the past you can treat this pretty much like a gouge uh, if you go straight onto the wood and tilt the handle all the way up there is very little likelihood that you're going to get a catch so you know initially if you buy this tool I would recommend kind of using it in that configuration and then as you get used to using it then you can uh, do other cuts as well and if the tool is you know 45 degrees to the work as well like it is there you know, there's less likelihood of getting a catch as well, and it will actually usually give you a smoother cut. And there's our first real look at the base as well. And again, it's going to look pretty awesome with those, you know, how all that epoxy is incorporated into the wood. I mean, it's just, uh, and again, you know, I, I keep saying this, but you know, the epoxy allows you to be so creative, so many different colors. You can work with rotten pieces of wood that actually end up being some of the nicest turnings that I've ever made. So, you know, um, I know that there's a lot of resin haters out there, uh, but I mean, you, uh, you can't argue with the fact that, that this bowl is just absolutely beautiful. Now I'm pointing out some cracks. Um, some thermal cracks and I will show a little further in the video as to what I believe is the issue and how it's being corrected. Like I said earlier, this is a three bowl set. So what I'm doing is turning a tenon and that way I can flip the blank around, hold it with the chuck, clean off the base and get a glue block on the bottom of this piece. I didn't want to, I could have turned a tenon on the bottom of this, but I really wanted to uh, make the largest bowl that I possibly could. So that's why I, pu I put a glue block on the bottom of it. And of course, one of the benefits of turning a tenon on the very top of this is that after that piece has been cored, you can then grab it with the chuck and turn another tenon on the bottom of that bowl so that it can be cored as well.
And of course, I could have used my vacuum chuck to hold this piece um, to turn a tenon uh, in the future after it had been cored, but I realized that probably most people don't have vacuum chucks. So I thought I would show a method that, you know, pretty much all turners can use. So this is a block of maple. Um, if you are going to use the waste block glue method that I use, stay away from softwoods. Um, softwoods like pine, spruce, and fir, um, there's a good chance that they won't be strong enough to hold a piece like this. And keep in mind that, you know, this, this, this first casting here probably weighs, I would say, 15 pounds with all the resin and the wood. So, you know, you, you really want uh, to use hardwood if you can. That way uh, the, the tenon won't fracture and lose your piece. I should mention that I'm using the Phoenix here and it has the number one cutter on it. So it's a small little cutter. So it's good for getting into really tight areas up against that tenon like you see there. Uh, you'll see it on the platter later on when I turn the bead on it. And just knock the little nub off and then you're ready to flip it around and grab with the chuck. All right, we are all set up for coring. I've got my number two knife set in from the one-way coring system. And I've got my Core Pro cutter in from Hunter Tool Systems and tailstock extenders so that uh, hopefully we don't have any, you know, things flying across the shop here. All right, so anyway, I'm going to get I'm going to go for three bowls in this set. I'm not going to get greedy. And uh, let's see how we do. So coring this piece was fairly uneventful. Uh, again, the Corpro cutter from Hunter Tool Systems. <laughs> uh, if you do any coring, I'm telling you right now, you got to get one of these. The key to success here is to make sure that you just use even pressure and you don't try and force the cutter through the casting. If you do that, you will probably get massive amounts of tear out and chip out with the resin, which you certainly do not want. Um, I find that I like to advance the support a lot more than say if I was um, working with green wood here. But you know, as long as you go um, nice and easy with this, it'll cut through this like butter. And that's why you shouldn't cut them off because this could come flying. No harm, no foul this time. Don't usually see that. Hmm. All right, well, we'll have to fix that too. Big thermal crack in here. Right there as well. I think that it's still safe enough to core. No, maybe not. All right, I guess it's time to pour some resin. All right, so I didn't bother filming it, but anyway, I've got some little dams made with plastic cups there. On the outside here, there's two, three as well. Some of these, I'm not so sure, thermal cracks. It might be just some chip out. And what we're going to use is the new Artcast from Designer Epoxy. And it is a one-to-one -one epoxy. Everything so far has been a two-to-one except for the quick cure. But uh, this is a one-to-one. -one. In order to keep that color uh, running throughout the casting, I figured that it was best that I tinted this resin as well. So, all right, I don't know if you noticed it or not, but part A is actually quite thick with the art cast. So, uh, this was suggested by the owner of Designer Epoxy, and that's to warm it up in uh, a vat of water. So, I've got coffee cup from my home province, Moose. And um, part A is quite thick and it's a little tough to mix. So I've heated up this, this cup of water and I've put the resin into it. 
and it flows really nice and it's actually a lot easier to mix up now. So what I'm going to use is a syringe and I'm just going to fill up all the voids on all of these pieces and get it into the pressure pot. So of course on larger projects, uh, it was suggested to actually take those two, um, two jugs of, of A and B and just put them into, into some warm water with the caps on. Make sure you leave the water uh, below the, the bottom of the cap. And you'll, you'll find that the resin itself will really flow a lot better. So, um, and you know, you can do this for virtually all epoxies, but for this one, and I do this also, I also do this method for the for the quick cure as well. Uh, I think maybe another option would be if it's a sunny day to just stick the two jugs in the sun. Um, that way you don't have to worry about any water contaminating your work. Uh, but as long as the caps stay on, you shouldn't have any issues. And I mean, you can tell like, it's flowing really nicely. There, I don't see any leaks. We'll get this in the pressure pot and we'll see you guys tomorrow. All right, looks like everything's been filled in nicely. I uh, still got these plastic bits to get off. Uh, but yeah, I don't see any more cracks, so that's good. Let's get a foot turned on this so we can turn it around and get the last cord on. Sometimes I find these plastic bits that I use are really hard to come off. Uh, if you can, do your best to get them off because what can happen is one side will loosen and it will come around and, you know, if it's got a sharp end on it, it could probably cut you pretty decently. So, you know, do your best to, to try and get rid of those plastic pieces prior to turning. I know that sometimes it's you really have no option, but um, in this case, I was able to pull them off. So here I'm cutting in a foot. Uh, I'm not going to go over the glue block on the bottom of this just yet. Um, ideally, I would, I'm always going to try and use a tenon like this when I'm coring. One thing of note, you'll notice that the support is kind of flopping around the support arm. And, you know, it never dawned on me. Uh, I noticed that things weren't working properly. And it wasn't until later on that I realized that what had happened was chips have gotten down inside where the, the coring arm goes into and it was throwing it off. So it was sitting just a little bit higher than it normally would. So before you use a coring rig, make sure you blow out both of them holes where the support sits and the knife sits. So I'm, you know, I'm carrying on with coring. Uh, I've, I'm still kind of a little oblivious as to why this is happening because I mean somebody didn't come into my shop and change the adjustments on it and you know it was pretty much after this core was done I, and you know I, I looked inside and I said well there you go that's why so a bunch of chips had fallen down on top of the little spacer block that one way uh, provides and it was thrown off the adjustment so you know just watch out for that in the future because it certainly can be a problem Since that tenon was in place from the initial turning, it's just a simple matter of flipping it around, hold, grabbing up the chuck, and then putting the glue block on the bottom. And there's the largest core. For the platter, I decided to use my Supermax drum sander. So I've got 60 grit in there, and you know it's it's very effective. Cleans off all that excess epoxy. You've got two parallel surfaces prior to mounting it on the lathe or putting a glue block on the bottom of it. Uh, that kind of shows you the speed that's involved. This is kind of in real time. So it takes a little bit to get through here. I've muted the volume because it is, it's actually quite loud. But, um, you know, I, I think I'll be using this method a lot more in the future when it comes to uh, more flatter work such as this. After this was flattened, I took it over to my um, belt sander slash disc sander and ground away all the excess epoxy around the rim and then held it in place with the cold jaws and put the glue block on the bottom of it. So here we are mounted outboard. Uh, again, I'm just holding this with that little 
um, help melt glue uh, waste block that I put on the bottom of this. Um, I know that there's a lot of people that are switching to this method. I'm, I'm hearing a lot of people saying that, that they really like doing it. And, you know, of course, the main reason why I do this, here I am filling a little bit of holes here and there with uh, some star bond. The main reason why I do this is because if you follow my channel, you know that I do shiny finishes. And you can't do a shiny finish in one coat. You could do it with a friction polish. But, you know, I'm, I'm not a fan of friction polishes and I've never been a fan of it. Um, I know that a lot of people use them, but, you know, as far as longevity is concerned, um, these finishes that I put on here, like the old salad bowl finish from General Finishes, uh, the new Water Lux that I'm using, these are superior finishes and they're meant to last for a long time. And, you know, I, my this is kind of what my my customers want. They want low maintenance or no maintenance finishes. And so that's why I continue to do these finishes. Are they a pain to do? Absolutely. There's no doubt about it. They're, they are a lot more work. And that might be one of the reasons why maybe my work is more expensive than others. But in the end, you're probably going to get a better product. Well, there's no probably. You are going to get a better product. And so that's why... I've made that decision to stay with these finishes and to do finishes that take three and four days long to, to do. Uh, you need to ask yourself if you're buying a turning from somebody and uh, especially if it's just a mineral oil uh, or a mineral oil beeswax finish, which is certainly better than a mineral oil finish. Um, why are they, why are they using those finishes? Number one, they're non-toxic. Absolutely. But you know, they're quick finishes. Dip it in the mineral oil, put it on a drying rack, put it out the door. So, you know, these finishes require a lot of maintenance. And, you know, let's face it, as human beings, we can be lazy at times. So after you've washed your bowl and, you know, if it's being used for function and you don't coat it with mineral oil or beeswax, then you know what? Maybe that's the one time that your bowl is going to crack. So that is why I use these finishes that seal up the wood. Even if the finish was stripped off the surface of the bowls I make, the finish is embedded in the pores of the wood, preventing it from, you know, taking on moisture and losing moisture because, of course, that's where cracks come from. And let's be honest, I love my shiny finishes. I, I find that these shiny finishes will bring out the beauty in the wood long before any mineral oil ever will. All right, so we've been having some issues here with cracks. Um, so anyway, I've got a few. What I've done is I've made some dams around the areas that we want to fill. And what I'm going to do is uh, I've mixed up some Pro Series here. This is inside the vacuum chamber. So what I'm going to do is fill these little areas up and then we're going to draw a vacuum on this and hopefully that will draw that epoxy down deep into all those cracks and completely seal them. Um, I think that this will work. Last time that I had an issue with like this, I didn't use this method and it'll be interesting to see if this time, if it does in fact work. The reason why I'm using the Pro Series is because it's, uh, it flows well and I've got a lot to do on this week's project anyway, so I've got lots of other bowls to do as well. So I'm in no big hurry for this. So I'll throw this in the uh, pressure pot overnight after we uh, draw a vacuum on this and then finish it tomorrow. So the ArtCast did a real good job filling up all those really big voids, uh, but you know, and to be honest with you, I didn't really think it was going to be a factor. But as I turned away the belly of the of the bowl, the wood and the resin in there, there was just these small little thin cracks. So I thought there was no harm in trying this. And again, I tinted that resin the same as I did with the art cast. And, you know, this was a success. And I will certainly do this in the future. Um, looking at the finished piece now, you know, you really can't even, uh, I'll point it out to you at the end of the video here, but you know, if I don't point it out to you, you probably wouldn't even really notice it.
very effective. You can see air coming out of the cracks down there. I got this vacuum chamber off of eBay many years ago. I don't even know the name of the manufacturer, but I was having issues with trying to get it to seal. Um, I need to redo the, the seal on the top of it. Once that's done, I'll, you know, it'll work a lot better than it is. It still works. It's just kind of finicky at times. And there you can see the air coming out. All right, I'm just going to leave that under vacuum for about another 10 minutes. Then I'm going to release it. And you can see down there how there's bubbles coming out of there. So I'm really hoping that after I release this pressure and, or sorry, this vacuum, and then put this in the pressure pot, that everything is going to be filled and good to go. So I've been thinking about this bowl set and why I had some issues with it. And I think this is the problem. There's my two pressure pots and they're right up against this heater. So the thermostat is on the other side of the room. So, I mean, this gets so hot that you can't put your hand on it. Like it's very, very warm when it's trying to kick the thermostat off that's on the other side of the room. So what I think is happening is inside the pressure pots is getting really, really hot. I have no idea what that temperature would be, but I bet, you know, it's probably 80 degrees or more. So, what I'm going to do is take these pressure pots, move them over on this side of the room where my rack is here, take this rack and move it back over there away from the heater because I really don't want it over top of the heater as well. I've already turned my little bar fridge so that it'll fit in there and I can open the door. Just got to switch the door around. And um, I think that that will alleviate some of the issues that I've had. It never really dawned on me till now, but I'm assuming that that's probably what's going on here. And I mean, it's really only been on two or three bowl sets that I've done where there are really deep pores and I had some issues. So, and again, I don't even know for sure if it's the thermal cracking that's causing that or if it's something else. I don't think there's any harm in trying it. And if it solves the problem, we're good to go. Anyway, uh, if you got any thoughts on it, I sure would like to hear it. It will also open up the floor a little bit here too. It's kind of tight through here. All right, so there's the pressure pot location now, and the thermostat is just up above there. Uh, there's the heater over there, of course. Uh, these Rubbermaids, I'll just keep them below the heater. And you know, ideally, this would, this room would probably be about another four feet wider. It'd be perfect. Uh, it's it's certainly a good space for what I do in here, but. Ideally, it'd be a lot wider. So the drying racks down there, and of course, this bench is what I put my bowls on when I'm doing the finishing for them to cure between coats. Anyway, talking to the designer epoxy, he said, "Yeah, he thinks that being having those pressure pots against the heater was a bad idea, and that was probably causing some issues. But we'll find out in the future." All right, let's get back to turning. With all of that said. You know, it, it's only been an issue on castings where I was at the maximum pour depth or more. Um, so anyway, it'd be interesting to see if this, I, I, I'm pretty confident that it will actually solve the issue. Uh, so I'm just briefly going to show uh, the other two bowls being done. I'm not going to make you sit through all of that um, because the turning principles are pretty much all the same. And of course, sandpaper.ca with the three and a half dimple discs. Well, all right, it looks pretty awesome without the finish. I just imagine what's going to like with the finish. And speaking of finish, we are going to use the Waterlux again, original VOC. The burl eyes here, just simply amazing. Pearl and the resin. I mean, come on. Beautiful stuff. All right, when I get the small one done, I'll bring you back for that. There you go. It's some Burl Islands in a green sea. This is probably the nicest small bowl that I think we've done so far. 
beautiful little bowl. Still very hard to make a living at something this size. I know there's a lot of people say that, oh, you know, you should make more of these bowls, but the thing is, it's very hard to make a living on these small bowls. I'm just going to be honest. But that is pretty spectacular. All right, we'll see you guys tomorrow. All right, so we're out of the pressure pot. Everything looks good. All the voids look like they've been filled. Let's see what this beauty is going to look like. So, along with um, the bowl here, I thought I'd point some stuff out. I have a new tool rest. As you can see, this one is 18 inches long. So, you know, when you're working on deep stuff, um, it's good to have a tool rest like this. My other one, I think, was 15 inches. So, this should really help with working on deeper bowls. And I thought I would show this as well. This is how I get the glue, my hot melt glue. This is from Canadian Tire here in Canada. I'm um, sorry, I don't know where else you could get it uh, in other parts of the world. But anyway, I just buy it in bulk. And this is probably the best bang for your buck if you're living in Canada. I think they actually might even ship to the States. Anyway, worth checking them out. So there may be some of you wondering why I don't have a curved tool rest. This is outboard and I have yet to find a tool rest that's actually shaped like this because they're all like this for inboard use. Um, I should also mention that this is made by Robust. It has a hardened steel rod on the top which is what you want so it doesn't get dinged up. And I got this from Artistic Wooden Supply in Toronto. So I'll elaborate on that a little more. Uh, on the outboard end of this lathe are left hand threads. And that's great for lefties. Righties would probably have uh, some issues using this. If there was, if I was turning outboard like I am here, but on the left side of the bowl, then of course you could use normal, normal right handed um, tool rests. Uh, but in, of course that isn't the case here, but of course it would have to be right hand threads on the outboard end as well. Uh, the tool rest, the hardened steel rod on the very top is important. This lathe that, that this is a 20 inch general variable speed when I bought it was somewhere around $7,000. So it's not a cheap lathe, but it did come with these cast iron tool rests that, well, they're garbage. They would get dinged up all the time and you were forever filing them and sanding them uh, so that the tool wouldn't dig in as you're trying to slide it across the tool rest. So if you if you have a lathe, if you're a beginner and you, and you don't realize it and you look at your tool rest and it's all kind of dinged up, then take a file, file it down, try to keep it as flat as you can, uh, polish it, and then you'll find that your tool will glide across it a lot better than, you know, what it probably is so there you go i mean um you can't see any spots in that bowl where it was filled uh, so you know between the arc cast and the pro series it did a fantastic job filling up any of those cracks and you know they are not noticeable whatsoever and there you go that's what the surface looks like after being sent at 60 grit and we are ready to move on to the next grit I'll remind everybody that in the description down below, uh, there is links to all the sponsors you see to my channel where you can get some discounts uh, for any of the products that I'm using. And just use code inlaygym at checkout. Last couple of things, buffing with the Triple E compound and then cleaning with denatured alcohol prior to the first coat finish going on. All right, this should look pretty impressive when the finish goes on it. Check that out. Beautiful. That resin is fantastic and the burl ain't bad, I must say myself. Still got it mounted in the chuck. Wow. Right, we'll see you tomorrow when I'm doing second coat. It's platter time.
So if you didn't notice, I thought that I would color coordinate today with my red shirt and the pearl red resin that we're using. So the back side of this platter is very similar to the lemon glitter platter. Um, just doing some profiling here. Um, again, using the Hercules from Hunter Tool Systems. Uh, it's just, I mean, look at the shavings coming off of that. I actually never rotated the cutter on the Hercules here for uh, the three bowl set and this platter that I did as well. Uh, it stayed in place the whole time. So there, I mean, that's kind of an eye, your first real glimpse of what this, this piece is going to look like. And, you know, I'll give you a little spoiler alert that, you know, this is right up there with probably one of the best platters, if not the best platter that I've ever done before. It's absolutely stunning in the end. Another thing of note, if you look at the trash can, uh, you'll see rags draped over it. Those have finish on them, so they're drying out. And the little trash can you see there is actually filled with water, and that's what I dispose of with my rags. That's That way we don't have any spontaneous combustion and burn my shop down. There's a real good look at it up close. No filling required on this piece. Now onto the face. Even if you run it through the drum sander, there's still gonna be some variations after the glue block goes on it. So what I like to do before I do any profiling on any of these platters, just square it off so that you know that things are true and round uh, and parallel before you start uh, basically doing any profiling. Just to make my life a little more uh, difficult, I decided to do a bead on this piece. Uh, I was actually, I'm just kidding. I mean, I was kind of, I like challenging myself and uh, not, not ever doing a bead on a resin and wood combo. Uh, I thought that I would give it a try. Uh, certainly made a lot easier with the Phoenix that you see here with its small little cutter. Um, it's actually pretty, pretty surprising how fine a detail you can actually use uh, this tool with, that you can get with this tool. I think I'm going to have to start using the manual focus settings on, on my camera because it keeps going in and out. Here's a closer look at it. Uh, you'll see when I stop the lathe that there is a little bit of chip out and tear out here and there. So just going really super light cuts with it. There we go. There's some chipping there. So, you know, it's got to go down a little further yet. And lots of it there. And you can, if you look closely at the platter on the inside and the, the outside where the rim is, you can see how much cleaner cut it is. Um, so, you know, it's, again, it depends on what you're doing. Um, but, you know, these tools I'm finding are just, uh, I'm really digging these tools from Hunter Tools. Uh, and you also may note that I switched to a smaller tool rest when I was doing that. As I don't have really big hands. And so I, I was having a hard time kind of controlling the tool. So I was able to just kind of hook my hands around that smaller little tool rest that originally came with my lathe. And uh, it actually worked pretty nicely that way. Again, just touching up the bead on the inside. I do find making platters like this where you're trying to keep them flat uh, is hard enough to do. But when you had that bead on the outside, it, it makes it even harder when it comes to sanding. Ooh, boys, I tell you that um, trying to cut that bead with the resin and the wood is probably the hardest beading I've ever done. 
Uh, even working on the face of this, most times when you do beading, it's it's like on a pepper mill, so the, the grain is running in this direction where, of course, that's not the case with this. Well, I guess technically it is, because uh, this is pretty much all in grain here, but man, so easy to chip out. And uh, anyway, it's done. Uh, hopefully we can retain that detail when we sand. But that's tomorrow because it's the end of the day and I'm just, I'm beat. Anyway, see you tomorrow. So I'm sure that there, there's a lot of skeptics in the crowd that think that you can't um, sand beads, power sand beads, but I'm going to show you that you can. <laughs> uh, again, trying to keep that flat was an issue, so that's why I switched to that sanding block. And once you've got it nice and flat, then of course, as long as you don't stay in position in one spot too long, then it will remain flat. Now here's a super close up of the dimple disc and you can see that it wraps around the bead and I've shown this on pepper mills and this is the first time that we've done anything like this on a bowl or on a platter. But you can just sort of, and I'm just lightly kissing it uh, inside and out and definitely not sitting on the top of it very long. And there's the initial standing on it and you know it looks pretty darn good. Still a tiny little bit of tear out, um, but you know, overall, as far as sanding is concerned, um, sanding these, you can power sand these beads, and you just got to be careful when you're doing it. About every second grit, I took the sandpaper off of the, uh, the sanding pad and just did a quick little touch right around the very base of the bead and on the top of it. Try not to flat spot it. So the piece was sanded to 800 and then here I am like I usually am with the triple E buffing compound from the BL buffing system. Once that's done, clean it again with the denatured alcohol and get it ready for our first coat of finish. Well, good morning. This is the first coat of Waterlux. And this is a spectacular piece. This is probably one of the best platters I've done. Wow, what do you think of that? Look at that resin. I mean, the burl is fantastic. I haven't even really seen the backside all that much. There you go. More awesomeness. A little bit of clear resin there almost. How strange is that? You never know with resin. Very, very cool. We'll do the second coat on this tomorrow and we can do actually the second coat on the bowls right now. There you go, there's the second coat. Pretty darn fantastic. You can barely make out where those cracks were. There's one there. And don't really see the other one right off the bat here. Anyway, it's very uh 
Very cool. That resin there is awesome. Like, wow. And the burl is fantastic as well. All right, so I'm not going to bother showing the other two. I'll just show them at the end. And I'll show this one when we do the foot. And that'll be it. This video is going to be super long as it is. All right, see you later. All right, it's time for the second coat. Well, guess what? It's still beautiful. <laughs> it is absolutely fantastic. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Backside. Pretty darn nice too. All right, we'll see you when I'm doing the foot. If there's another coat, I'll do it the same as I did this one. So after over a week or longer of uh, kind of fooling around with this three bowl set and this platter, we are finally ready to cut it free of its waste block. Um, happy days. <laughs> uh, it's been a challenge, uh, something that I enjoy though. And uh, I'm really hoping that Marcus and his uh, his wife really like these this, these four pieces. So I was asked to cover this again. This is my vacuum chuck. And in order to have this, you have to have a hollow arbor. So of course I do. Uh, this piece screws on the inboard side of my lathe. There's a bearing in here, so it allows it to free spool. Uh, one way does have all different adapters for, I would say, pretty much all lathes. So when you buy the system, they would ask you what size spindle you have on your lathe, and they would uh, help you out in that regard. Ordinarily, if you're right-handed and you work on the inboard side of your lathe, then this would be on the outboard and vice versa. So the hose comes down to a valve assembly. There's a gauge. When it's in this configuration here, uh, it pulls air through here, so it's you know it's not going to work when it's in this configuration. Then it's going to draw a vacuum, and that's the vacuum pump that you see back there. Marathon and gas, gas. Uh, it's a great system if you do any amount of bowls. I uh, I would highly recommend getting one. So the large bowl presented a little bit of challenge. Um, when I initially roughed out the pieces to go into the casting bucket, uh, I used my circle jig and I had to drill holes and you can see the holes in the bottom. So I had to make a mortise on the inside to uh, get, get basically get rid of those. So that's why the large bowl has a, um, a mortise on it and the other ones don't. Um, not a huge deal. I was a little concerned about maybe going through the bottom when I first seen them, like, uh oh. And it's funny, I didn't even really notice them until I put it on the vacuum chuck, but they were there when I put it, when I initially put the glue block on there. Anyway, I'm just showing little clips here of all these pieces being done. I actually used the gouge on this all resin piece in the very bottom. I actually do find the resin is a lot easier to do um, when it's not combined with wood if you want to use a gouge. All right, let's have a final little chat about this beautiful set of bowls and our awesome platter. All right, so we got a lot of stuff to talk about. Uh, this platter, like I said in the video, I think is pretty darn close to being number one. Uh, it is absolutely beautiful. Try and get a picture, try and get some video of that beating up close challenging to do um, to say the least here is the back side now I wanted to try and keep it on the outer pieces so I started with my signature here and then it wraps around to the other side of the platter 
if I can, I try to not sign on the resin, but sometimes um, there's just no way around it. Uh, the pearl effect right here is really awesome. And you know I like mixing my pigments quite strong. Um, fun project to do. Definitely be trying to do some more of this beading in the future. Uh, hopefully Marcus and his wife will actually, th these are gifts for his wife. So hopefully she's the one that really likes these, uh, this platter and this bowl set. All right, so that's it. This piece ended up being 13 and a half inches across and one inch tall, and I believe it's uh, three eighths of an inch thick. That's kind of what it is, and there's the profile right there. Beauty. Here's the big bowl. It is 10 and a half across and four inches tall. Beautiful burl, beautiful resin. Almost a little Burl Island right there too. Um, the very bottom, that is probably still gonna require two more coats of finish like the platter. Again, trying to sign on the wood is a lot easier than trying to sign on the resin, but um, the smaller one, you'll see that I had to sign on the resin. Um, I was, like I said, I was a little worried that I was going to go through the bottom of this, but there's still lots of thickness here to get rid of those little um, holes that I use for my circle cutting jig. Uh, really beautiful piece. I think I'll probably end up putting another coat of finish all over the outside, uh, maybe the inside as well. Feeling a little bit of roughness in it, but uh, right now it's got three coats of the water lux on it. Beauty bowl. Here's the largest core. This one, there is a crack right here, and you can see it, but it is all sealed up for sure. There's the very base, still requires two more coats of finish. There's that crack right there, I don't know if you can see it on the camera or not. Anyway, it, it, it's not really noticeable, like when you look at the bowl like this, you can't even see it. Um, it's just when the light hits it. Properly, you can see through it. So if it's sitting on a table, you'll probably never even see it. Um, this one here has got a neat little burl island in it. Very cool. You can see some of the pigments sitting on little uh, pointy parts of that burl. Okay, so that is, what is this? Seven and a half by two inches tall. Beautiful little core. And last but not least is our five and a half by three quarters of an inch tall small bowl. And again, like I said in the video, it's it's Burl Islands in a sea of in a green sea. This here I like this little detail all by itself. There's the very bottom, still needs another coat of finish. And of course I had to sign on the resin. So if you're gonna put finish over top of your signature like I do, um, it certainly can be done as you can see, but don't push, don't press very hard on the finish when you're putting it on or else you'll strip it right off. So just lightly put it on. Once that sets, then you're probably okay to be a little more aggressive with it because the, the ink will have a coat of finish over top. Anyway, uh, it's a beautiful little bowl, like I said in the video, and probably the nicest small one that I've done so far. So, uh, yeah, please let me know what you think about this week's video. Uh, I know it was super long, so people that are looking for these long videos, well, you certainly were satisfied this week. I think it's probably going to be over an hour long. Um, really not my intention, but uh, since this was kind of all of a gift for somebody, I figured that I would try and do it all in one video. 
So uh, please leave a comment down below because, of course, that's where we're going to get the next winner of the 50,000 subscriber giveaway bowl. We're going to pick from the comments. And uh, please share with your friends. Uh, that's probably the biggest way for me to grow my channel. So if you can do that, I would really appreciate it. As for next week, I'm not exactly sure what we're going to do. Uh, it's starting to get hot here. Uh, it's 31 degrees Celsius here today, which is unseasonably warm. Uh, it is supposed to drop off next week, so maybe uh, I've got some coring to, or I've got some roughing out to do that I got to get done. So I certainly want to wait for cooler temperatures to do that because I'll be sweating profusely, and nobody wants to see a sweaty Jimmy. Trust me, you don't. All right, well, that's, I'll leave you with that. Till next week, take care, stay safe. Don't forget that bell, and please share with your friends. See you next week.